Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit, lit. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official, outstanding, most dedicated Miss Jamaica. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. You know, my dear, walk on. But I want to let y'all know, y'all need to like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, you name it, we're on there. But first of all, you need to go to our Patreon channel because that's where we're going to have our full-length interviews. And when I say full-length interviews, for those who want to see before time, those are the places you need to go. Patreon and our YouTube membership packages because they're going to come out, but they're going to take a while to come out, okay? If y'all want to see them before anybody else, y'all got to do our membership packages. Thank you in advance. Hey, man. Check it, man. Hey, man. Listen, man. We got a girl, a young lady, mm -hmm. uh, a, a most esteemed woman. Uh, a queen. Man, a straight up queen, a woman king. <laughs> I'm so Don't sick of y'all. Listen, Don't man. <laughs> <laughs> this young lady right here, man, is doing so much for the community. She's definitely outstanding. Um, we about to get it all up in her Kool-Aid and try to figure out the flavor. Mm. That's what we do over here, man. Letitia Scott Jackson is in the building. What's going on? Listen, I am elated to be on tonight. Let me tell you something. God is so phenomenally amazing. Like Anytime I can get an opportunity to just share about who I am and why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just elated, always. And I'm glad you all offered to have me here on tonight. Man. That's good. It's a blessing. But, you know, I always love to hear where you come from because everybody has a story. Everybody right. has a testimony that can help somebody. No matter young, old, it You're can right. bless somebody. So we'd love to hear your story. You're born and raised in Louisiana? Yes. What well, I was Louisiana? born in Houston, Texas. Oh, in Houston? Yes, raised in Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay. Um, how you born? Well, she poured in Houston, not that far. No. So when you were born out there, your parents was living in Shreveport at the no, time, or they were living in work? Houston. They were living in Houston. So actually, how old were uh, you when you were raised in when you moved to Shreveport? Oh, I was newborn. I mean, oh, they so moved, they just, I was just yeah, they moved like right. I guess why after did I was they born. go to Shreveport? Your case okay, good as mine. I don't know. <laughs> the preacher had a. Uh, gas station my dad had all kind of stuff going so I'm okay. not really sure entrepreneur um, yes he was an entrepreneur okay. as well as he worked too he was a worker bee I say that all the time mm. I tell people my daddy died a broke preacher you know mm. what I mean but it's not no he wasn't broke because then if you well I'm you, not talking about you know, financially I'm okay, talking about cause, yeah, cause spiritually if you know God spiritually you I ain't, ain't broke I was just meant to say <laughs> listen not Spiritually, because he was saved. Right. I'm talking about he just right. didn't set the, you know, what we right, know now and what I'm teaching right. now is what I really th would wish someone would have taught to me when I was younger. But so. how many black folks back then taught their kids financial literacy? Even today, there's a lot of people who don't teach their kids financial literacy. They don't, they don't even give them the game. And game applied means elevation. I give you the godly game. You apply it. Once you apply it and you start tapping into your potential, mm -hmm. then you become productive. Mm -hmm. Then you become prosperous. Yes, exactly. You know, you know, you you really, you really, the steps of a good man is all about the Lord. So wherever he ended up and whatever knowledge God decided to let him have is totally on him. You know what I mean? Well, so at the end of the day, I went searching for the word when my mom passed because I wanted to know why she was so, you know loving God so much, but really wasn't to me that in tune with what the word of God was saying. But God has a way of dealing with them old spiritual gospels that they used to sing. Yes. It's something about a song and, and the way that the, 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 the feeling the delivery that you get, of it yeah, is what you get. The when feeling, yeah, in, in the yes. situation you're going through, you're old slaves, that old stuff that they went through meant something. It, it yes. really pretty much spiraled and turned and moved us in entrepreneurship. That, 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 one old slave that used to be in, in the big house. Uh, that helped us to understand how people were supposed to live in a, a place where people are, are you know, so pretty much understanding how to maneuver in, like, like different situations where economy and all that stuff take place. So when I look at it, I really thank God for our ancestors. Oh, I most definitely And some do. of the stuff that they faced, because without them, we wouldn't be who we are today. Well, I say that, and I mean it like, um, in a loving way, but in the same token, my dad raised us, right? He said, train them up in the way that they should go. Mm -hmm. So I, he always saw the best in me, even though I had some crazy stuff going on. I was a silly sinner sometimes, mm -hmm. but he always saw the best in me. But he didn't, like you said, they didn't, I don't think they really knew 
I think he wanted to be an entrepreneur because he tried to open so many different businesses and he did okay, but it still never made ends meet. Mm-hmm. Mine was the same way, you know. It was just a different time too when you start to look at the times. Well, like my dad, for my dad, it was just where he was, but he had his own business. But it just he didn't do. Of, of course, they do what they do so we can do better, right? Makes sense. At least they were trying. Because they were trying. Yeah. They didn't fall in that same category where like, let me go work for this man and just focus on that because that's a steady income. At least he was trying to do his own right. business because so many people are scared to try their exactly. own business because it's not certain. It's certain that I can go over here and get this check and pay my bills. It's That's a lot of people. I get right. that from a lot of people when I'm doing life coaching and when I'm speaking at different events. The people will come up to me when I'm done. And the first thing they'll say is, you inspired me. Mm-hmm. I've been scared to step out on faith. Right. But faith without works is dead. Leticia. But you've never always been like this. No. You're still Le- into I was going, childhood. Yeah, I, I, we're going to get in her childhood. I, I want to tell the people where she's from and all that stuff, like what part of the city she come out of and all that. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I was raised in Shreveport and by way of Cedar Grove, Louisiana. I always call it Cedar Grove, Louisiana. This was on my Facebook page, Cedar, Cedar Grove, Grove, Louisiana. <laughs> yes, so that's where I was raised. And you used to be all up on Jewel and all her and all that. Yeah, I used to be all over all there. All through them streets. Yeah. Back yeah. in the days, gang violence was bad when you was well, in the 90s. Well, let me tell you, after, after, but, but by the time the 90s came, I had already done so much crazy stuff in Shreveport. My dad moved to Minden. We were in the country for real. Okay. But all my people are from Jackwaters. Okay. So, you know, he moved to Minden, and that was just even worse. Mm. What's the craziest thing you've done in, in Shreveport? He said you did a lot of crazy stuff back then. Tell me tell me a story of something you did. Well, this time, when he moved me to the country, I was just in the ninth grade. Mm-hmm. And so I'm now trying to, you know, I'm playing piano for the, the quartet group, and I'm playing for the church, and I'm playing basketball, and I'm making the honor roll, and I'm running track, and I'm doing all this stuff. But I wanted to be in a gang with my friends and my homeboys, and I thought this was what it was about. So I was rebellious. You know, my dad go to sleep out the window, I go with the gun, and I'm trying to fight, and I get caught at school with a gun. I'm an honor roll student. What enticed you so much about the streets? Mm, it really was just... The, the, I guess I don't know. I don't want to say the connection, but I think it was just the fact that I just wanted to do what everybody else was doing at that time. But I wanted to be the leader. Like I don't want to just do what y'all do. I want to see what y'all doing so I can outdo y'all. Mm-hmm. But that didn't work for me. So my dad stopped that real quick. Mm-hmm. What was what was uh was you was you blue or red? Red. Yeah, yeah, and and you were young, and yeah. it was really popping in those areas. Exactly, that time. and they wasn't doing nothing constructive nor conducive, stealing and doing all this crazy stuff, throwing rocks at people. Eighteen was it was nothing conducive. It was just the fact that the people that I knew were doing it, and I thought that's what I wanted to do. But my mom was fourteen years younger than my dad, and she only had my sister and I. So she talked him into moving to the country where his church. Well, his church was in Minden, mm-hmm. so she, we moved to the country. So once we moved to the country. It was a rap on the gang stuff. That right. was that was over with. Okay, you couldn't go back and forth. Well, how I was gonna get because you're so young. <laughs> well, how, right. did you, how did you hit your first bump in the road though? Well, like I, like how did you end up going getting caught up in in, in criminal activity? Well, here's the deal. Once, even though we moved there when I was right. 14, we moved there when I was 14, and being from Cedar Grove, my babysitter's grandson was like the kingpin in Cedar Grove. Hmm. And, every, and and he was the first person I ever saw with a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. And he had the table in the middle. And I was like, that's what I want. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but that's what I want. Mm-hmm. And his cousin was, his first cousin was like my best friend from Ella, from kindergarten on up. Mm-hmm. So he ended up giving me, a, we went there, my brother and I, for a backyard party. My dad wouldn't let my brother go without me. Like, oh, you're going to bring my car back on time. Take Chuck with you. That's my nickname, Chucky. Mm-hmm. Take Chuck with you because you got to be back. And I ended up connecting with him. My brother left with somebody, with a girl, and didn't come back on time. And I got a curfew. I got to be back in Minden from Cedar Grove at a certain time. Now I need a ride 35 miles back to the house, you mm-hmm. know. So he ended up giving me a ride home. And he made a stop. He already had people in that city working for him. So he makes a stop, and I'm sitting in the corner. He's like, yo, Chuck, come on in. You know, dude, I'm 16. So you're seeing everything. I was tripping. 
When I be, let me tell you something. When I'm life coaching, I tell people all the time, the enemy is so deceptive, so manipulative. I mean, your haters, your naysayers, those people are so conniving. It's just like Craig. So when you, when you, this evidently back in the 90s, you know, because I'm a real life hustler, back in the 90s, this was, you've seen him, he was dropping off, uh, uh, ounces, uh, uh, yes. pigs. Uh, he was uh, doing. Uh, what was he doing? Quarter keys. No, he was doing keys. keys well, this particular powder. night, I didn't know what I was seeing, but he was doing powder, and then they had to cook it up, and then they had to cut yeah, it up. Yeah, what they used baking soda. All that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then was they when they cooked it? Did they do it on the stove in the microwave? They did it on the stove. I eventually learned how to learned do it. How, of course, you was a cook yeah. at, eventually. But when that day when you went in there, how was it to see oh, that activity? Doing, it scared the mess out of me. It because she, did, she didn't know what it was and what they were doing at that yeah. time. So and then you, I'm looking at the one lady trying to jump out the window with the window now. And that's what I was just about to say. What's she trying to jump out for? Your guess good as mine. I say it this. That's why I say when I talk to people to encourage them, the enemy is just like when I used to sell crack. Crack will make you think you can when you know you can't. Mm. You can't jump out no window with the window down crazy. Mm -hmm. So when they was in there, of course, were they doing drugs? Did you see they the They was pipe? doing all kind of stuff. So they yeah. was so some people hitting the pipe They in were there? doing everything. Okay. so But they, they cooking and doing it. Uh-huh. They had somebody in the kitchen doing one thing and some people in there But waiting. how you can have a productive business. No, no, I'm finna get into that. Like, was he on it? He wasn't on it. Mm -mm. So no. he basically was organizing. That's all. That's so it. he the man. They that know he the it. man. Yeah. They know when he come in, he the man. This just one of his houses. Exactly. Pop it. I like that. Okay, now. Yeah, 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 <laughs> no, yeah. but yeah. I'm trying to figure out okay. how you, because then if he the man and you were in a productive business, so call. Um, anybody that you have there, isn't that why when I watch, I get things off of movies. Yeah, I don't. Okay? I lived I know it. you lived it, but so, what I'm saying is that when you, um, you see people, they're doing all that, they make sure that they're naked. They make sure that they're no, not stealing no. anything. They're, you know what I mean? They're not taking no, it. They ain't doing, doing that. They ain't doing because that. Because that's the movies. if you taking it, that means you taking some of my product no, that I could have no, sold. No, so you're what? stealing no, from No, no, no. For me, for me, okay. when you get there and you got people there, a lot of these people know you, they respect you. Even though they on drugs, they still can operate. So you got leaders in the midst of this too that, that's on drugs, that respect you so much, they'll do anything for you. Mm -hmm. They'll And that's the way it be. Now you might have some people there that's real blown gone smokers, but you got some other people there that's pretty much cool, you know, they might smoke, but they gonna make sure nobody take nothing from you. And it yeah. can be two or three of them. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. But she took a lot from the one he hooked me up with. She took a lot. And yeah. That's because she knew I didn't know what I was doing. She, she, so then okay, she, I go back to him like maybe every, when he come back, maybe every two, three weeks, he's like, oh, yo, Chuck, how much money you got? Like I'm I'm climbing out the window when my daddy go to bed and I'm on the corner yeah. and I'm hustling and, and thinking I got it going on. And she was really beating so because just, she had to cook it for uh, me. She had to give it to me and I had to distribute Let me go back. Mm -hmm. So this she, because we didn't really get into detail. When I was talking, I was talking about the whole situation you walked into right. when you went over there with mm -hmm. it. But this she must be a pointed girl that he linked you yeah, with that. and said, y'all rock out together. And she was from L.A. So she was she from asleep. L.A. And she was, was she on dope? But she wasn't on dope. She at eventually, first, at first, she wasn't. She wasn't. I know. But it. she eventually, but she's been in the game for a while, so she yeah. could teach she you. She was city slick, right? So when she was, she, you say she was pinching off all of the stuff. Yeah. So did she give me what she? Because she know I don't know. So mm -hmm. yeah. she give me what she want to give me. Then when it's time for me to pay him, I pay him. And he, I never was like, oh, I got this much in savings, this much in savings. So one time he was like, yo, how much money you got saved? And when I told him, he was like, what the? Why is that all the money you got saved? I was like, well, that's all the money I made. You know, I went so keep twenty five at that time playing for the church. I was only getting twenty five dollars a Sunday. So when when he gave y'all a portion, how much was he giving y'all when this thing first took off? Like like when, when I, he would give it to her and you, y'all had it. What, how much was he giving? you? He would give it to me, and I would take it to her to cook it for me. Okay. So he would give me like three ounces. He just started out yeah, like three, three ounces. ounces, and then I just started. And I know because I've always had an anointing on my life, so I didn't like doing it. I just wanted the money. So every time I would sell to the crackheads or whatever, I would just go around the corner and I throw up. Or when I go really? home on my knees crying, asking God to forgive me. This is the truth. It's in my book. And I was just like, this is not what I need to be doing. My daddy gonna kill me if he find out. Mm -hmm. he, he gonna mass murder me on the spot and I don't care where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So eventually I told him, I'm like, yo, look, I don't like dealing with them people. Like they stink, they make me sick, I'm sick of this, but I need the money. I don't need the money, I want the money. Cause what we had a say? roof over our head, we had right. food, had clothes, going to church every Sunday, going to school every day. And how old were you at this time now? 16. Still 16, okay. And going on 17 basically. So then he said, um, 
He think he said, oh, he just found another way for me. He was like, okay, I'll just let you sell to the people that sell to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, cool. And that's where it went. But then by the time I got 19, fast forward, I had already got too far in it. So now I already got a distribution charge because. This, oh, you got caught up. This girl. No, well, it was my, my, my. One of somebody that we knew, I don't understand. Somebody that we knew came to me and they, and she didn't know that this man was an undercover. Mm -hmm. So she getting sales on me. So you got an indictment. An indictment. Yeah. So, and and so at, at nineteen. Going into at eighteen. At eighteen. So then I'm I'm going into nineteen. When but you, when you got your indictment, what did your dad say? Because I know it's in the paper, right? Yeah. People he, would know about it. No. Yeah. They they had to. No. No. Let me back up. So I got the I got the. Busted before I got the indictment. Okay, okay so that's yeah. when he found out for the first time what you were no, doing, or he, he knew. Well, he didn't really. I think he knew, but he didn't want to know. My mama like never, and both of them are deceased. Mm -hmm. But my mama never gave me like the benefit of the doubt. Like she already knew Chuck always doing something, and my sister was a mama's girl. But my dad was always I was a daddy's girl. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got nineteen, I'm pregnant with my son. I'd already had my oldest daughter at sixteen, going on seventeen, mm. and so. The people come to, um, they come to set me up for five ounces. Yeah. But I got all this stuff in my dad's house. I always thought I was slick. You know, my brother called me slick. Don't nobody, yeah, a lot of people call me Chucky. Some people call me slick. So I always thought I had more sense than everybody, right? So I put the drugs in my daddy's car because I'm like, he the preacher. So if the police come, they're not going to search the preacher car because he's the preacher. Mm -hmm. I was crazy. That's why I said the enemy, I was a silly sinner. Just, Thinking I could sell drugs Monday through Saturday, and as long as I respected the Sabbath day, I would never go to prison. I'm telling you, this is what I thought. And that's my whole what life. you thought my whole life. Yeah, wow. I was I, that whole time. Like I would, you couldn't call me for nothing on Sunday. I wouldn't do nothing on Sunday. Twelve o'clock midnight Saturday, I'm back in the house. If my curfew was ten, I was back in the house at ten. And every time, whenever you're doing what you're doing during the week, and you knew that it was wrong, you'd go in um, and repent pray. and repent. And I would climb out the window as soon as they go to sleep and leave the window crack and climb back in it when they go back before they get up for, in the, for work. So when you when, when when you was doing this and you get you get the indictment uh, or you get busted, uh, where is this guy at? Is he is he taking care of business with you, making sure you? Oh no, I was done with him by then. I'm, getting, I'm dealing now you're with dealing, who you you, who you, you got your straight up, oh you got yeah. a straight up connect with somebody. Yeah. Who, but why L A? Because we had it but down they here. Was coming, no, but they were coming and they were giving me better prices. And then I had some people. You didn't in have Houston, no connect down. Here. And they had, and I had a connect in Houston. And I was doing both of them at of the course, same time. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's where it be, but. Yeah. So I'm yeah. driving back and forth to Houston, yeah. and then when they ain't got nothing, then I'm doing something yeah. else. So, you know, and they got me messed up a couple of times. You know what I'm saying? So, long story short, my dad um, goes to take my mom to work, and by the time he come back, the the feds, I mean the the task force was already at the house. No, they already had set up a plan to to catch me that day. I was nine months pregnant, seven months pregnant mm. with my son. So somebody already they've been watching because you they've been watching because I'm terrible. Yeah. I was terrible. So they come in. Well, the guy comes first and knock on the door like, yo, Chuck, um, um, I want the five ounces. So I'm like, okay, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, when I get to the door with him, he was like, oh, that's all right. I changed my mind. Like, what the heck? That don't sound right. It didn't make sense to me. So he's like, yo, um, so-and-so around the corner said I can get them for 35 and get five for 35. I'm like, but you've been getting them from me for a grain of a pop. Like, so... Okay, well, go get them from him. I ain't got time for that. I'm already pregnant, miserable. I had just got back from Houston. I'm hot. You know what I'm saying? I ain't got time for that. Go. Okay, bye. Then about 30 minutes later, he come back. He knock on the door. Yo, I changed my mind. He was just giving the people time to get there. I didn't know that at the time. By this time, my dad's pulling up in the yard from taking my mom to work. So when he comes in the yard, he parked in the car, and the driveway was like behind it. You know, them old houses, like down the driveway. Yeah, yeah. But the people coming through the front door. And when they come in the door, they just get him out the car and bring him in the house. And he just looked at me. He had tears in his eyes. And he was like. So the police brought him in. How did you feel? I, I wanted to die. Like, this man don't see no wrong in me. None whatsoever. And now I'm thinking, like, they not going to find the three keys in the trunk. And then I got 18 ounces of powder in the So you house. got three keys in the trunk. In his trunk. Three kilos. Already cooked. Already, already cooked. cooked. Out of order. 
And then why would you do it in the house? Because nobody, nobody did, they were already cooked when I got there. Yeah, yeah no, but why would you even have the drugs at your house and not I somewhere was else? Him. Because I stopped, I was at my dad's house. She's, that's a preacher. She, so I'm yeah, thinking like yeah. they're yeah. not gonna ever come to here. Yeah. So, okay, like, I got whatever. you. Got so you. I thought I was out slicking them or whatever, but I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Three so, keys of cocaine in in in, in, in the truck. five ounces. And, and the five, five ounces. ounces. And then I had three thousand dollars worth of twenty dollars rocks. Yeah, did you have How any many cash guns? on you? I ain't have no cash on me. Are you no have cash. guns? I just go. No guns. No guns. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that's the crazy part because that's the way it be. Like, you more, and you was, she was more happy in the end, too. If the laws hadn't came because she had scold and she was comfortable with the dope that she had, man, she was happy. And you know what I'm saying? Because you knew you had, you, you knew I, you had control. You knew you had power. And so my dad comes in there and they put him on his knees and I'm sitting on the couch because I'm big and pregnant or whatever. And so he just looked at me and they were about, they were about to leave. Without the three keys, they were just gonna leave within five ounces and the three thousand dollars to rise. And this one man just come like out of nowhere, like he was from Bozier. So why are you in Mendon? What you doing way down here looking for me? And what'd he say? He said, We didn't search the cars. I was like, What the? My daddy said, Where your car keys? And I had a Z28 IROC at the time. That's what the we Hawaiian were blue. Hawaiian yeah. blue. Yeah. My daddy was like, Where your keys? Give him the keys. Da, 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 da. He just looking at me. And I'm like, don't give him your keys. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you said yeah. I give him mine. Just yeah. don't give but he don't know. Cause he had his car there. He had driven my mama car. So he was, so his car was still just sitting there. Yeah, uh-huh, it was a rebeaver. So his car was there, but he had taken my mom to work in the other car. So when they searched the car and they came in there, that man was like, Cause uh, let me tell you something crazy. The whole time they thought Chucky was a boy. Because my nickname is Chucky. Nickname. Who gave you that nickname? My daddy when the I daddy, was born. She said, oh, okay, when why I'm Chucky? Because he wanted me to be a boy and I wasn't a boy, so he just started calling me Chucky and I just still ended up being Leticia from, by my mom. <laughs> okay. But um, so Three he, keys in his truck. So he was just looked at me and he looked at the me people and he, and so they take, they handcuff both of us though, of, of course, and they take us down and he just like, when we get in the little room, he was like, I'm just gonna take the charge, they'll give me probation. That's what he told you. And I said, he said, because I don't ever want you exposed to prison life. You got too much talent. You got too many gifts. I can't read music. I play all this stuff by ear. I write songs by memory. I mean, I just make up stuff. You give me a name, I can write a song in two minutes. So I, God has given me all these talents. And I took the hands that he blessed me with and just and did destroyed. some crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, destroyed people's lives. And that's just the so truth. That's what's real. took a three key. How, how much did they charge him with? Oh, they charged him with like a, they didn't even charge him with the whole key. The people thought I beat him out they dope. Cause he was like, oh, yo, um, I think it was like a, a key and a half. They only, they gave him 15 years though. Probation or no, pen? No, pen. So he went to the prison? Yes. 15 years. And my mom divorced him because she said, you love her more than you love me. Wow. Mm. So 15 years he had to do behind the three keys. Well, he did eight, almost nine. nine years. How did you feel when you heard that? I wanted to die. I was like, oh no. Y'all cannot do this. And you I didn't like, try to no, come up and be like, it's yeah, mine, it's yes, mine? Yes, I did. I told him that. He was like, they're not going to do that, Chuck. You just acting stupid right now. Like, don't be stupid. Just, I'm going to do it. Because at this time in the, pre- the state, pre- they didn't even send him to the feds. They sent him to the state. state. So they could, his church members could go and they would pack picnic baskets and make him sweet potato pies. And that was his favorite. They could go there and take their stuff on Saturdays and have like little picnics. So they and, didn't turn their back on it? him. Yeah. What the church like? people, they didn't turn their back on him at all. Mm-hmm. What unit was it? Mm-hmm. Um, Winfield, Louisiana. Winfield, Louisiana. Yeah. And he was he, he just went there at the time. Yeah. And then he and got and he got out and he died. Did you How I, long I, after? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Um like four years like four years five, I had my daughter. She was four when he died. So like four years after. So, after he got out. So when he wow. did the fifteen years, how long were you, were you locked up at that time? I had never got locked up. That's what I'm saying. He took he the charge because he no longer charge. But watch this. I get secret indicted the very next year by the feds. Wow. They were after you from the get-go. Just, uh, that, that's just, my dad had told me that. He's like, oh, you're going if mm-hmm. you don't stop what you're doing. And I lied to him. I was like, I promise I'm going to stop. Because Cause even you. after all of that and how you felt when he went and how many years he got knowing that he was a preacher, you still didn't stop. I stopped for like 30 days because he yeah. asked me to. And I was like, so I tried. So why did you go back? Because that's all I wanted that's to all do. all she knew. And, and, and I say all I knew, I, I th- I've always had a hustle mentality. That's right. But And, and, I, and I always wanted to make some money. It was not It was basically all I knew, but that's what I wanted to do. You but, know what I'm saying? So then now here I am, then got caught up by the feds, and I'm stuck like my name. And, and I'm daddy, stuck like Chuck. Your mm-hmm. daddy did nine years, and you, for the, how long were you out while he was in? Before you was eight, not even a year. So you wasn't even out a year, but 
that had to be a tough year just being anyway, they, it was and then the thing i would still go like i leave choir hurts on saturdays i'm driving to the prison Straight to, him. to go see my dad to go see my dad because i was his you know he i was a daddy's girl and was, so was your mama mad at you yeah she of was, course she was mad at me and him yeah because she divorced him i can imagine how she, she felt about you the whole time mm -hmm. and how did that how did that make you feel well, she still, like, even though she was mad at me, she never, like, she would still keep my kids. Oh, she didn't she, like, treat I don't want you, you terrible. To. No, she, I mean, she had, she like, an attitude or whatever, but it. she like, oh, yo, Chuck, you gonna go to, you know, she always said, you gonna, you gonna end up dead or in jail. She, that, she always said, and I said, stop speaking that on my life. She like, but that's what's gonna happen because that's how you living. So you just gotta take it for what it's worth unless you change your life. Mm -hmm. And so she never got to see me change because she died while I was in prison. Wow. At the and, age of 42. So mm -hmm. when you. Young. Yeah, but th let me go back. I want to I want to go back to your dad being locked up all those years. Um, you go to prison yourself while he's well, you get locked up and go to prison while he's locked up. Who got who gets out first? You get out first, right? No, he did. He got out first. Mm -hmm. So how, you had to do a lot of time. You did nine well, years. I think, no, no, no. I, I, let me tell you. So when I when he read about it in the paper, he had a stroke. Wow. And it paralyzed the whole left side of his body. Wow. And then he But he knew you was going to get caught up because he But he just was hurt. Right. You know so it, 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 he knew it cuz I mean he knew it. He knew it cuz he but said he just it was to but he never but I'm still reminding him still going to visit him putting money I'm doing everything I'm I'm thinking that's necessary. Right. But then when he when he read it once he got in the hospital he wrote the federal judge and he said whatever time you're going to give her just add it to the time that I already have. Because I don't want my daughter going to prison. Wow! And what did what? But did, that, didn't, that help. didn't work. The judge, when I went before the judge, read he the, told you. The that. judge told me. He said, "You're a minister of society. You going?" He said, "You going? You are." So he going. probably knew that you was the reason your dad was even in there. Of course he did. Wow. And, yeah, it's crazy. And and so, your dad's in prison. You're in prison. You're writing him. He's writing you. Mm -hmm. Y'all writing each other back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. You just tell him you love him and tell no, him. No, he was just sending me positive stuff. He was like, "Yo, don't give up." No, he didn't say yo, but he be like, "Listen, don't give up. Nothing beats a failure, but a try. At least you didn't get the life sentence that they offered you. You, you know, you got an opportunity to get out and make it right. Yeah. Like you got so much talent. Do whatever it is. Do make money with your talent. If you know how to flip the drugs, you can flip other stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna uh, or you're going to lose your life." So when he died, I mean, when I got out, God just started letting everybody die that was close to me. So he removed every leading post that I had. So if I wanted to go back and do it, who gonna keep my kids if something happened to me? That's what I'm thinking in my mind. Like, right. my dad's dead, my mom's dead, then my only son get killed. So I'm like, oh, yo, no, I'm doing it. I wanna, go, I wanna go back, I wanna go back, I wanna go back and talk about your father um, and being in prison. And did anybody come home or, or did you ever hear stories where he was able to help somebody? Because I know he touched a lot of people Man, while being locked up. He didn't adopt so many people, children. You yeah, come home he like, came, he, I got people right now that still call me sister because right. he touched them and he impacted them. That's and right. He gave them hope and he, you know, they got out of prison and he's still helping them, giving them money, taking them fishing. That's right. He was doing all that stuff before he died, like with people that he met in prison. I'm going to take. He, he stayed connected he didn't to know his daddy and I'm just helping him my dad right. I have that same spirit so my dad was a dad to everybody when I was growing up my cousins my you know my friends my homeboys my older cousins that was around the age with my brothers um he had other kids three sons outside of my mom so he would still help other people's kids so then I get out of prison I tell people like God bless me because I was broken, blessing people like I had it. Yeah. So I done took on everybody's kids that my son, he was the only boy, I had four daughters, and he would be bringing his friends home. Little white boys, everybody. He's bringing them home. And I'm buying them underclothes, shoes. I don't have no money, but any little money that I would make, I'm helping. When I buy for my son, I was buying for other people's children. So one of the boys, mama stayed not even a mile away, and I had never even seen it, but they sleeping on my floor every night. Wow. You know, so I just think I took that spirit on from him. God knows what he's doing. He does. Remember when Joseph got uh, sold off and locked up and, and he never complained? Never. He never even said one thing mm -hmm. of complaining. No. Nope. He was some, he was like a, a, a at, during that time, he was uh, like a, a Jesus of that time. Meaning 
he he was representing that lineage to where right. he saved the people. He saved his brothers, and they all bowed down to him. He got the coat and all that. His right, daddy right. gave him a coat I of remember. all colors and mm-hmm. all that. You know, but he got locked up for stuff that he didn't do. Potiphar's wife tried to act like, you know, she tried to get at him. And uh, the thing I just say is God has an ultimate plan. He was able to help the butler and the baker when he was locked up. Exactly. When God lets you go through these situations, you go through them for a reason, in a mm-hmm. season. Somebody he had to talk to and touch was in there. So whatever you done, it was nothing but God moving the, the whole needle, no matter how you look at it. Right. Because can't nothing happen outside Unless of God's God will. will. That's right. It's up to God. That's so right. that was that was, that was powerful. It's just touching story. And a lot of people, you know, I saw the time. I always say, you know, my life is a movie because I did. You know, you know, I was talking to somebody, a film producer, and I said, listen, you can't make this up. No, you can't. You know, people be doing these movies and these series, but in real life, to say my mom divorced him because he loved me more than he loved her. He loved her. I think he just had that daddy's love because I tell you, I said I, my son was my only son, and boy, we would ride or die. We How old was he when he 17. Came? And we oh. just opened the clothing store in Baton Rouge and we were doing a lot of stuff together. I raised entrepreneurs. So then we, and, and so when he got, God showed me, let me How back up. Die? I was about to say, God showed me three days in a row, he was going to die. The same way every day. Did it scare you? Did it you know me. what it and was? And then um, my baby daughter, one night we were in Baton Rouge and we were in the house sleep, and she just stood straight up in the bed. And she said, oh, Lord, I love my brother. And in her sleep and laid back down and went to sleep. And and then when I go to sleep and I dream that some Jamaican, excuse me, some Jamaican drug dealers were killing, about to kill him and they was about to murder him, like execution style. And in the dream, I'm steady telling them, don't kill him because everything he needs to do, he has not done. But I done done everything I think I've, I've already lived this life. It was so surreal. The next night I dreamed the same exact dream. The next night, that Saturday night, going into Sunday morning, I dreamed the same dream. I wake up out of my sleep this time, and I just start calling him. Calling, I call my godson when I told you I raised, and I'm calling, and nobody answers the phone. So I just cry myself back to sleep. Then the next morning, because I lived in Baton Rouge, and I'm driving four hours every Sunday to church because I'm the musician. And before my dad died, he says, whatever you do, don't leave Reverend Jones Church. Continue to play for him. So even though I'd moved to Baton Rouge, I was still dedicated and faithful to my calling. They weren't paying, wasn't paying me that much money, but my dad asked me to do it, so I was doing it. So we were in Shreveport for church. I stayed at the hotel in Bossier. And so... The next morning, I get up, and I'm calling, and I'm calling. And he finally answered the phone. It's like 9, 15. I got to be to church at 10. So he said, Mama, he, he didn't even give me time to say nothing. He just said, Mama, I'm not going to have you late for church. I know Reverend Jones be tripping. You know, he was being funny, and he was always playing a lot. And he was driving my truck. I could hear the wind blowing. I could hear everything going. And next thing, and he says, okay, Ma, I promise I'm going to be there on time. I'm going to have you at church on time. I was like, all right, L, don't be playing because Reverend Jones going to dock my pay. And I can't afford that. And I hang the phone up. And that was the last time I ever talked to him. So I get to church. My stomach, oh, I get sick. And I just start throwing up and I'm sick. But I'm calling like people in Bozier like, yo, come give me a ride to church right quick because I got to be on time. So I finally get a ride to church. And um, while I'm sick, I never, ever turn my phone face up during church. But this particular Sunday, I'm on the piano and the other lady on the organ, and I turn the phone face up. So when Reverend Jones get up to preach, I look down at the phone, and it says, please go to the hospital. Three back black male with Justin and Corey. No, it's somebody two black male. I'm sorry, said two, that to you? Two black or? male. And it was no, nobody I knew. It was like an unknown number. So it said, please go to the hospital. Two black males in the car. It was actually three people in the truck with two people besides him in the truck. A girl, he was giving them a ride to drop them off to pick me up. And uh, his friend. And so it was them two and him. And so when I see that, I'm like, that ain't for me because Al would have texted me if something would happen or whatever because he was a real responsible kid. So I just gone back door to door and listened to the sermon. Then I look back down again, and it says 911, go to the hospital because two black males in the car. And, I'm, and, and, and in Shreveport, you know you're only going to LSU. So I just go back to the, I get out, I go out of church, and the urchin standing at the back door. Mind you, he had my truck. So I asked him, could he drive me off at the hospital? He was like, for what? I was like, I don't know. I just need to go there. Like, I'm frantic, panicking. 
He was like, okay, um, teacher, I'll take you. So he drops me off. I get there. I'm by myself. Nobody with me, period. And this lady just giving me the run around. She giving me the run around, giving me the run around. Now I'm getting the attitude. Now I'm going back to Chucky because you really playing. Like I asked you, like, is this my son? Like, he has a tattoo with my Letitia on his neck. And I, and this is what he looked like. And it, and is this him? So she goes this time and she stayed like 30 minutes. But while I'm standing there, this preacher that I don't even know he knew me from being Reverend Jones' musician. And so he walks by me and he turned around and he come back. And he said, you going through something. And I just looked at him. And he went in his pocket and he took out some mustard seeds. And he took them and he put them in my hand. Now, at this time, I'm, in, I'm not in the spirit. I'm, like, mad right now because, like, I'm trying to see what's. So I don't even want the mustard seeds. I don't want to hear what you got going. Mm -hmm. I'm human at the end of the day. So when he gave them to me, I'm just holding them. Then I just get mad and I throw them down. I was like, I don't. I ain't got time for that. I don't, I, right now, I don't want to hear nothing, but is my son okay? So then they come back. Nobody's with me. And the lady come back, and she was like, I'm sorry. He didn't make it. Da, 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 da. That's how she said it to me. Like, yo, she had this chaplain saying that. I ain't trying to hear nothing y'all got to say. So I lose it. Like, I, I black out, and I just run out in the middle of the highway, on King's Highway, and I fall out in the middle of the highway. Wow. And so by this time, my preacher come in. Because the Ursha told him, I dropped Leticia off at the hospital. Don't know what's going on. And he looked, he walked out there. He was old school because he was old. He was already in his 70s. Black, with white hair, with blue eyes. Wow. Reverend Lennon Jones. What did he say? He said, if you don't got dog it in the house. He said it just like that. Got dog it in the house. If you don't get up and act like you got some sense. He said, if you would have been in truck, he still was going to die. It was his time and not yours. Now get up and act like you got some sense. Wow. And he picked me up, and we went back in there, and that's when I called my daughters, and I, and I called his dad, and I just was sitting there. I was like, God, you know you so wrong. Wow. That's all I kept saying. I stopped going to church after that. I stopped tithing. I stopped I playing for the church. I was so angry. When I came to Dallas, I came to Dallas with an air mattress, a TV, a What rim. year was this? Two thousand, the end of two thousand and eight, like wow. October. And how old were you at that time? Two thousand eight, I was, but right at uh, thirty eight. Wow, I was thirty eight, and so I came just like that. I didn't know nothing about Dallas. I just had some people that used to run for me here, so I would come on this Greyhound and drop off the stuff and yeah, go back, so whatever. Did. So I didn't really know nothing about Oak Cliff and all that stuff. I just knew I got approved for an apartment on the internet. They said first month rent free, deposit free. And that was in um, oh, what was the name of them? Tierra Linda. No, no, no. No, it wasn't. It was um, what's the name of them apartments? Everybody chose the name of the apartments. Huh? Rosemonds. So I they they look good. You just on wanted to change because all the stuff that been happening. Well, down because there. every time I go outside, like as soon as I think I'm okay. Oh, so when we were staying in the hotel, I walked off and left everything I had. I didn't go back to that clothing store. I left all the merchandise. I was angry. So when I wouldn't even put, I didn't even put them in school. So when I get here, it's like I gotta get it together. So one day I go back to Louisiana to talk to my godfather, who's a bishop in Shreveport, and he said to me, he says, "Listen, you done lost your mind because you got them kids. You gonna go to jail if you don't put them in school for one. For two, you know God." You know how to make money. You struggling and you don't have no money and you broke and you around here tripping. You got to get it together because you got to live for your daughters. And that was my eye opener. Like I'm writing hot checks. This is the truth. Writing hot checks to feed them pieces. I'm borrowing from my drug dealing cousins and oh they went. I wasn't borrowing. They were just doing it for me. Just on the strength that it was me. Oh Chuck gonna shake back. You know what I'm saying? And so once I finally shook back or whatever you want to call it, God blessed me to meet my husband. He was from here. And he and I ended up getting a little building to do taxes because I owned a tax company. It was tax season going into. And he came in and, and I met him through somebody else. And um he I fixed a tax lien for him. And then every time he would come, I would be depressed. You know, he coming to check on his stuff, but I'm in, in this little bitty office over in Oak Cliff, and I'm depressed every time people I try to play it off and I had an assistant, but every time I would talk to him, I guess he felt it. And I had the flu. Couldn't mm -hmm. shake the flu. So he comes back with this gift basket full of Theraflu, Night Quill, crackers, and all of this stuff. And we just started talking. And that was in January. And in February, we started dating in May. 
we started living together. And then November the 20, November the 16th, the next year, we get married. And then October the 6th, 2011, we go to prison in two different states on the same day. Huh? Okay. Wow. Yeah. So you... you so I told you, you, you But it's, this is not the guy you would now. Of course. What he go to prison for? He a square. He a square. But square has ruled the world. So he guilty <laughs> by... No, so when I guilty married him... Guilty Yeah, so when I married him, I put him on all my paperwork. Mm. So mm. I go... Because I'm doing the right thing. You see what I'm saying? Like, oh, let me... Do the right thing, but were you, what were you doing wrong? Why they even arrested the people, you? They committed the fraud against my business, so now all us on the business the taxes. and people need to hear that because here's the deal. So you had so the business wasn't just yours; you had other people with you. No, it well, was it just hurts. my business. So, so I get married, I put my husband on the right. Family. I got that yeah, part, but nobody what? else worked for me. So what happened was this man from Shreveport was going around to different places like Fast Tax and H and R Block and all these places, okay. and he was acting like he had a business. You know how I go, mm -hmm. and he just went and got a tax ID number, saying he owned a construction company. So he didn't own the struck. I mean, he owned it literally on paper, on paper. but there was no actual company. building, mm -hmm. or they wasn't putting in no work. So they make all these W twos for their cousins and their cousins' cousins and their uncles and mm -hmm. all these people and everybody he sent them to different places filing taxes well i wasn't at the building filing taxes i'm single at the time i'm doing me i got people working for me you know i'm lived i'm i'm traveling but it's in I'm your name that part so now because it's in my name and i print the government checks i'm the one signing the checks on right. fridays when they print the checks right so then after i moved to texas then they come five years later like yo you know, we got a warrant for your arrest, blah, blah, blah. But long story short, I win the appeal in the Fifth Circuit Courts. You can't charge me that's for somebody crazy. else making a W-2. That's like the judge. I told my lawyer, and he's a paid lawyer, and we lost the first case. I mean, I lost. I had to go to prison. Mm. But he's, I, I'm telling him, ask the judge. You're like, no, you can't talk. I'm paying you. What you mean? You can't tell me what the I'm telling right. you what to do. Like, if he walks into my business with a W-2, am I to critique it? Yeah, but how would you know? Cause you don't. You can't so know. what am I going to say? Oh, um, what's your name? I'm Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, is your W-2 real or fake? Am I supposed to say that when you walk in? No, that's not my job to do that. That's not the people's job that work for me to critique your W-2. When you come in, their job is to prepare your taxes. So long story short, I tell people all the time, and everybody that watches your podcast, they really need to get this book. The book is called Three Felonies a Day. Wow. By Henry Silverglade. Everybody in the world commits three felonies a day unknowingly. Really? A day? A day. I'm telling you, I keep that book on my desk. It's real. I don't care if you're the Pope, the politician, the apostle. I want to hear What's the most common felony that people commit a day? I mean, it's just, it's simple little stuff. Like, just say this one man, he had a business, and he was going to this scrap metal yard, and they was telling him, you know, you can take this stuff. But he, The contract was, you're supposed to take it, and discarded. He was taking it and selling it. Mm. So now the contract says discard. You're selling it. So now they done charged you with a charge. Like it's all in that book. Like you just have to read the book. It's so many different little things yeah, that people I, do. I want to go back and I want to go back to your father and your mother. That's such a touching story that, that they would. Did they ever, did she ever go to prison to see him in all those years? I don't even, you know, I can't even remember. I don't think she did, but and, and did, I hate to say no, and I hate to say that, but I don't know. even remember at all. I just know she ended up divorcing him, and she married a deacon from the church down the street. Okay, did she, <laughs> when he got out, did she? Did she was he, dead when he got out. Oh, so when he got out, he, he never she, got We to, both came from prison to the funeral. Wow. Yes, he came from the state prison. Y'all both came from, he come from the state, you come from the federal prison. To her funeral. To her funeral. What did she pass away from? She went to have a hysterectomy, and they didn't know that she had cancer. Wow. So she died two weeks after she had to disarray me. Wow. Man, and so what did your dad say to you at that funeral? Did y'all get to talk? He was just so happy to see me. He was just like, he was just like, you know, because I, oh, man. So my mom had done some things in the past, like, to my dad. Like, you know, just certain little stuff that she would do to him and, and she would hurt his feelings. And, and so I, me being a daddy's girl, I always harbored that and I had to ask God to forgive me. So by this time I had forgiven her. And, and you know, he told me when she did something to him one time and he was going to get her. And I said, why are you doing that? Like, I'm, I, you know, I almost grown. Like, why are you doing this? This was right before he, we got busted. And, she, and he says, that's your mother. Right. That's my wife. What do you mean why I'm doing this? 
That's what he, I'm supposed to do. And he said, you're going to respect her. Mm-hmm. I don't care how mad you are. So if you, what you mad for, I'm not mad. Right. But I was mad because I was shucky. I was mad. Like, you don't do people like, like, come on now. I'm just big. Even even when I was in the streets, I was big on loyalty. But now that I'm saved, I'm even more big on it. So if you, if I, if I, I just don't tolerate the extra and I don't tolerate the fake. So I'm like, yo, you know, he was just telling me like, you know, you got to forgive. Now it's like, oh, I've been done that. And like, I love you and I don't regret. He said that to me. I do not regret taking that charge. Taking that charge for you. Because it's going to make you a better person in the wow. long run. So how long after she passed did y'all come home? Oh, he came home like the next year. Oh, the next year after mm-hmm. she passed. Okay. And then I came, I went to the federal halfway house in Monroe, Louisiana. Like right after that. Like maybe six or seven months after that. Mm-hmm. Because see, when I got sentenced, instead of getting life, my lawyer was like, they offering you life. I'm like, for what? Like this man is tripping. <laughs> like I'm only... You know, 21 years old at this time. Like, you really finna throw me away for one? He was like, no, you're not one. You done done a whole bunch of stuff. You terrible. You know, you you really bad. That's what the man was like. You a bad and little that's girl. your lawyer who's telling you. But he was life. telling me the truth. And guess what he said? What? I don't even want your money. I just don't want you to get life. Mm. And he still worked for me. And when Christmas, it was right before Christmas. I got was an older like man or a younger man? He was a... a, a a Creole guy. He was middle age, and he was from okay. New Orleans. Okay. So he was like, yo, he went and bought all my kids Christmas stuff, did all this stuff for me, because he thought they, he just felt like he didn't have a fighting chance. And on the day of my sentencing, this is the truth. Lord, I thank you so much. I get so excited. On the day of my sentencing, I had a 30-day speedy trial. You remember when they used to do the 30-day yeah, yeah, speedy trial? Yeah, yeah. I had to be sentenced and convicted on the 30-day, or they have to drop the charge. I go to court. I don't know how I end up in court on the 30th day. I mean, I know how. Nobody but God. God mm-hmm. Now they don't have my, they can't find the records. Mm. God like, done wiped it clean. Guess what happens? What? That man said, he's in the uproar, but he got to do what he got to do. He said he don't even know why, I'm, I don't even know why I'm doing this. But I know if you ever come back before me for selling drugs, you'll get in life. I don't care what happened. I get eight years, federal time, I get, uh, no, I'm sorry. I get five years federal time, 60 months. I do six months boot camp. I was sentenced. I had to do the boot camp after I finished the first part of that, like two and a half to three years of that first part of the sentence. Then you go to boot camp for six months, and it take the other few months off. And then I had eight years federal supervision. And you knew he was totally serious about that. He wasn't playing. But they, that's so crazy. No. When I went back in 2011 for the tax fraud, same judge. They don't retire. They die out of office. So what did he say to you? That's he how he revoked you? my bun. He just was like, he already assumed. You again? Yeah, he already assumed I had done something. He was like, oh, no, revoke the um, recognizance bun and mm-hmm. um, reprimand her into the custody of the U.S. Marshals. Then he didn't even give me time to talk. Mm. He, just, he had told you. He didn't want to it see wasn't you. drugs. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. He just didn't want to see you again. Like, that ain't cool. He, and he had the nurse say, oh, you got in trouble. I say, like, first of all, no, I did not. He said, I didn't tell you to talk. Well, let me tell you, I'm not that same person. And he said, be quiet. To, yeah, my, I'm telling my lawyer, tell this man I ain't the same person I used to be. You know, like, I'm yeah. trying to convince this guy. But then, and then what's so crazy is, I go back to the same federal prison that I went to when I was 21. So they got the same lady working in R&D. She said, I knew you'll be back. She was from Jamaica, too. She was like, Scott, <laughs> I remember when you was a little skinny girl coming here. I was like, you embarrassed me in front of all these people. Wow. It was so funny. How long did you stay back in there when you... I in 2011 was, to 2013, but I won the, after I won the appeal, then I come home. Well, mm. let, let me ask you this. How many... Give me a touching story on somebody. I do this uh, segment called Prison Stories. Uh, give me something that happened in there that you seen somebody's life change or something that you felt is very special, dear to you, over all those times. How, how long was you locked up in all? Total time? Five, six, almost seven, eight years. Seven, eight Thank years. You. What did you, did, did you see anybody that you was able to talk to? I'm still, as a matter of fact, I still mentor people from the prison now. Of course. And a lot of people follow me from prison now. Wow. The guards follow me from prison now. Wow. And they buy my books and they buy my t-shirts and they, they support me. Um, and, and not just African Americans, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. But I got to talk to people because I always kept, even though I was going through, and even now, like when I'm going through something, I just don't let people 
No. So it was like I was able to talk to them and give them God and tell them about, you know, how much my dad loved me and how much, I'm, you know, I, I want to be there for other people's children. And everything, anybody that knows me from this last bid, the first thing they, t they inbox me or they see me on Facebook, you did just what you said you was going to do. Wow. Because I was in the room with three Hispanics this last time. Not one of them got to see their children. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Neither did Letitia because nobody brought my kids to see me. So that's why I started keeping families connected. And right now, this is eight years, new beginning. Never got a government grant. I've been doing it with my allowance. My husband gives the church 10%, and he gives me 10% of everything he makes. And for eight years, came January the 15th, I've been providing free luxury prison trips, free breakfast and free lunch throughout the state of Texas for anybody that has a person or a loved one in prison. Wow, state so. of Texas, so no matter what part of Texas. Well, here's the deal. I go f as far out radius as four hours one way. But like this week okay. alone, because they've been putting the flyers all over these prison sites or whatever, so people been calling me from Houston. So I'm, I told my husband, like, okay, so I need to plan a weekend to just go spend in Houston and rent about four black SUVs mm -hmm. and take my Mercedes van, and we just go down there, it's keeping families connected, and we just get a whole bunch of people from Houston and take them to Huntsville. So when I get back from Dubai, I'm going to be working on that particular trip for the month of June. Wow, so you basically, in your heart, you feel like your ministry is to reach out back to the prisoners. To keep connected because when you lose connection, see, when I felt like God didn't love me, I wrote a, a, a poem, well, just a short story for Reader's Digest back when Reader's Digest was popular when I was in prison after my son died. And the title was, when love don't, when you feel like love don't love you. So who is love? God. So when you feel like God don't love you, our hope is gone. And that's what I felt like. My mama, my daddy, my son, and my grandmother back to back. Wow. That wasn't cool. Did you, so, I, I want to ask you, did you ever do drugs? Never in my life. N never did, did you ever drink? No drinking. You just loved to never get, you love the hustle. Just love the hustle. But would that's you, it. um? <laughs> but okay, but why didn't nobody carry your kids to come see you? Is it because they didn't have a ride or because? First of all, I didn't really have no, their grandparents died after Hurricane Katrina. Okay. Then their dad, I mean, just being honest, God rest his soul, he died, I think, year before last on New Year's Day. He just, he, he didn't want, he didn't have the responsibility. He didn't have the means to do it. Let me say that. Because if he didn't have a woman that had money, then we didn't get nothing. They just know I'm real. So that's what that is. So, I, he couldn't get them. He was in Las Vegas. I'm in Texas. We from Louisiana. So I sent them back to stay with somebody from the church that I felt like I could really trust. And that... But could you trust And them? that wasn't a good... It, it was, I mean, they just kept a roof over their head. They didn't treat them right. They didn't do all this stuff. And I only had... At this time, I only had six months. Like, I was almost down. Like, six months, my stuff just got fixed. So... It just was the worst. So I, as soon as I got out, in seven days, I wrote a book called Where the Real Church Folks At. Hey, Where the Real Church Folks At. You going to bring me that book because you ain't bringing no book today, what? and I'm upset. And I'm going to bring you all three of them. I know that's I right. Got, and I got um, Grace and Favor from Prison to Pay. Okay. And, and then, the Queen. And then Queen, come on with your money, mm -hmm. make yourself. Got to have all three of all them. All three of them. So after I did that, I ended up turning it into a play last year. And we did a play at the Irving Arts Center over in um, Irving. And we, it was standing room only on a school night. And mm. I wrote the play. I just wrote it off the top of my head. My 17-year-old granddaughter, which she was 17 at the time, produced it. We had Little Nas X Daddy hey. sing at the play. We had um, Shirley Caesar's grandson perform in the play. Hey. And then, so we had all these people that I just put through. I, I call it throwing something together. But God showed people. At the end of the play, Luther Barnes mm. comes out. And we didn't even, we scripted on the day before the play. Wow. And he comes out, and it, it's me sitting in prison. And he comes out, and I'm sharing with him how so many people let me down that I really thought I could trust. Why nobody would bring my kids to see me? But then right after he comes, here comes somebody say, oh, you heard about keeping families connected? They brought your kids to see you. They here. Wow. You know, so that's what it's about with me. When them kids come out of that prison and you see the smiles on their faces, I've taken little babies that were born while their daddies was in prison to see the dads in prison for the first time. I have a Hispanic lady I've been taking for four years. She's in her 60s. Four sons in four different prisons. Every wow. every two weeks, she's taking 
different grandkids to see them boys you, you, in prison. You make sure that you keep them connected. I don't take you one time and not take you back. But you have some people, because we've had some people who sit in that same seat that you're sitting in that say that they don't want their children to come visit them because they don't want their children to see them in that state. But here's the deal. Like I just told the men when I went to go speak at the cows unit a couple of weeks ago, all these men are leaving in the next six months, but some of them have been there 29 years and 12 years and 14 per se, you know, so, so forth. But you can help your kid from prison. Mm -hmm. With wisdom, that's right. With wisdom, so get Joe Blow off the t off the tab, off the cell phone, and off the game, and tell him to watch some self help videos. Teach them about God's principles. Let them watch some Bible stories. You got and you tell your baby mama to watch them too, or your children's mother, whatever y'all want to, whichever way they want me to put it. You got you can help them because being in prison, you, all you got is time. Man, shout out to this woman, man. I'm I'm falling in love with you, Letitia. Don't do that, Stephanie. Sitting there and <laughs> no, not in that me. way. <laughs> it's, this is this no, is a love, yes. man. Yes. No, it's just the the things that you're saying is touching, man. I appreciate Rain for sending you over here, man. It, like I said, that's what I, I that's she know that's what I love. You know, I just love, I always say I love, real is real. Yeah, real I, is I just, real. I love to see that because. You know, there's a lot of prisons that I've wrote for the last 20 some years, you know, over the times, you know, not right. as consistent as I would like. But what you're doing is so commendable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just just a blessing, man. I, I really like that, man. So you was last in Huntsville. You say you was you was in Huntsville. I spoke at a well, as far as the prison trip. Yeah, we went to. Oh, my God. We did three prisons on one day. That was my first time driving the trip in almost a year wow. because I have volunteers. And so I, I went on the trip, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to two prisons, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to get back and then get to the train station. Because when I first started, I was so passionate because my kids went through so much. As a matter of fact, when I do my radio show tomorrow, it's called Letitia Talks. Mm -hmm. I'm interviewing my two do youngest daughters. Hey. Mm -hmm. You never done that before? Never. And because mm -hmm. they went through the most and right. the worst. They did. So I got to get that story so people can understand. Girl, prepare that tissue, you're going to be crying. Because it's a lot of stuff I don't even know that what they went know. through. Right. Maybe I don't want to know. But I know y'all didn't do my kids right. Yeah. And, I, and so when I But get, you need to know because there's so many people who are listening yes. that don't ask certain questions. And you, if you don't ask those questions or you know the know. signs, let me you tell you know. something. I was so broken when I I used to call people. Do you know where my kids are? From prison, from the feds. I can't get, you know, and then they write and then they got to send it through the person and they don't have send the letters and it was the worst. So people asked me like when I was in, um, what's them apartments called? The Browns Apartments mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago for Easter. My daughters and I, we do this as a family. So people, charity stores at home, discipline stores at home, mm -hmm. and none of them live with me. Mm -hmm. wow. But guess what? There I am, there they may be also. Wow. If they don't, they get blocked. <laughs> Money, phone, everything. I block everything. I don't play. Because you got to feel. See, you got to understand where God is taking us to because he blessed me so I can bless y'all mm. so y'all can see generations. that it wasn't it wasn't in vain. Mm. So are, are, when you guys get, after you do your one you, with your two youngest daughters, you're going to bring them back and do another show for me? We will. So I can talk to y'all. We will. Now? Cause I like I said I want to keep interviewing you. We you know what I mean? Like people need to hear these stories. But you know what? I said this to because I want to say this because sometimes I get I, I don't I used to just get discouraged. And my husband, he my king. He builds me up. You know he he in the nonprofit wasn't his vision. We don't have and he'll tell you in a minute we don't have the same vision. His vision is. It's generational wealth. His vision is making sure I'm protected, making sure my feelings are covered, making sure we get what we need, making sure I don't have to pump no gas, make sure I don't pay no bills. He makes sure these kids are good and he don't have no biological children. Mm -hmm. Wow. My husband and my oldest daughter is eight years of in difference in age. Mm -hmm. So he made sure this man, I give him all the respect. And, I, and, and one thing about it, everywhere I go, the first thing they say, girl, where you king? Oh, they know he's not too far because I love him because he was there for me. I want to get him on the show, too. You say he watched, what's his name? He watched Boss Talk 101. Fred Jackson. Fred Jackson, man. <laughs> Listen, man, I know you heard when I said I love your old lady, but I got my wife here, nigga. Don't start no mess. I got my old lady here. We've been married for 20 years, nigga, but I'm down with you like four flat tires. Mm -hmm. Listen. So when we... And I wanted to say this because a lot of people, they don't understand. I tell people when I get ready to give back, I always give my spiel. Man. I always give my message. It's a message in my giving. So when I went to the Browns a couple of weeks ago before Easter, my daughters and my husband and I, 
Well, he gives me to find the resources. We packed 175 Easter baskets. Wow. We went out there with the 175 Easter baskets. I talked from 12 to 1202 to tell them why. Because nobody did this for me. So I'm not going to give your kids nothing. I, don't, I wouldn't have wanted you to do for me mm-hmm. when I needed it the most. So when I do my giveaways for Christmas, this year we my, I mean, we give we, good stuff. We Apple watches. We gave away jewelry. We got the they, the main event in Frisco. Shouts out to Lily at the main event. That's my girl. They let me set up the whole place like a a, winter, a Christmas one a toilet. Mm. And so my husband and my daughters and I we going there on Friday and we turn it into like a toilet and people come in and they they sign up. So I know that's how I know how many people I do. We did 600, and Rainwater came. That's how it I is. met Rainwater last year because he came, and he went live like, yo, this woman is the truth. Yeah. Like, a lot of people just don't know me, and they don't yeah. know what I do. But, I write, my husband write to people in prison. He put money on people's books in prison. We give back. We don't just give back once a year. We do three prison trips a month. I do mentorship once a month. I just started a step team. We just performed our first performance Sunday. Hey. So at I, the Caldwell Center, did they do did you do it there? No, we did it. Oh no, we I was honored there with the ten thousand oh, yeah, did? with the ten thousand okay. dollar sponsorship. But no, we created it to show up for that. Mm-hmm. But then the next day we did a special needs gala for autistic children. Oh Beautiful. wow. Man. So and we did that and and I don't don't I didn't charge nothing. We come and we came with fifteen of us. The step team, the boss brothers, my two little grandsons, seven and eight, they own their own business just published the book That's and people hard. just called for them to come so they escorted the little girl and I spoke and my step team performed we come to let you know that it's a blessing in the giving and you can't outdo God you can't beat God so every time I get a chance I go by Easter basket Valentine Day candy my husband say every time God give you something to do it consists of spending some money mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Man. but you God keep providing right he says seek ye first the kingdom you, you, know, you got to, you got to see God's face, and you'll yeah. be blessed by it. You know, exactly. And so, at the end of the day, I just I thank God for you just being so obedient. Yes, it's a task, but it's 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 the assignment. Yeah. And if you do what God tells you to do, you you can't lose. You you on the winning team. You In know? a story that you told earlier, um, that when you got arrested and you had to put your child somewhere with um, church members, well, the only thing that came to my mind is. You start an organize, starting something if you don't already have it, where um, you have like a shelter or a home. I'm praying or about somewhere. that. You I know got what that I mean? vision. It was prophesied to me exactly. to do that. Exactly. But let me tell you what's so crazy because a lot of people be thinking, "Oh my God, I I I, I got to say this." So when I first get to the prison, the jail in Louisiana, the holding facility for the feds, I write all the prominent churches in Dallas because this is where my kids are. I'm in Louisiana. They here. Mm-hmm. And I started each letter with, I do not need your money. I just need somebody to take my daughters to church. Not one church wrote me back. Mm. That's why another reason I wrote the book. Mm. Yeah, the church is not the building. The church is the people. But they exactly. just let me know how you feel. If you read this letter and you put it in the trash and didn't write me back, or you didn't say, where are your kids? We go pick them up. We got a church bus. Mm-hmm. Man. Maybe they not. Maybe they wouldn't have gone through some of the things they went through. That's why when these women be calling me and texting me late at night, sometimes I get in trouble with my king because I'm answering folks' calls after hours. But Letitia, Jerry hanging with the wrong people at school. Letitia, Susie, Susie Q just ran away from home, and I'm getting up. Oh, my shoes tore up. I don't have no shoes for school. I'm getting up. But everything happens for a reason because if you didn't have that need for your children to come to you or if you didn't have nowhere you know if they took your children to church all the time you wouldn't be starting the organizations that you have right now because you wouldn't see the need for it you might be right so everything happens for a reason you see what i mean you went through that and you saw where there was a need because i asked god like what in the world was that for like i'm like and then sometimes when people interview me they say you wasn't mad no, I learned not to get mad after my son died mm-hmm. because that was the worst time of my life. Mm-hmm. And you can't do nothing without God. I love it when people, oh my God, thank you. People be getting on my nerves. I'm just going to say this, Mr. Boss Talk 101, Miss Boss Talk, because they act like you look at people and you think they got it going on. They doing this. Don't judge they the living like, cover. No, but here's the deal. Half of the people you see that you think got it going on, they not even saved. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're silly sinners. Mm-hmm. They just getting by because when you abundantly blessed 
nobody has to wonder. They don't mm-hmm. have to think twice. Oh, she's abundantly blessed, baby, because let me tell you something. I see the I see she living it. I ain't just talking it, I walk it. Right. Let me ask you a question. When you um when did you totally surrender to God? I mean totally surrender. When totally you, surrender. When you, when you said I'm this. done. Oh yeah, no. And I love God and I'm and I'm gonna get it right. Let me tell you something. When I got out this time, even though I was still doing my thing, going to church, I wasn't, you know, selling no drugs and none of that stuff. My husband and I had a business and I opened a clothing store outside of the tax company. So we was doing that. And so when we came home, he came home in 2015. I came home in 2013. 2015 was when we totally sold out. We got saved on the same day at the same time. So once we totally committed, it was just, I mean, I can't even explain the feeling that it's like to have a husband. You know, somebody need to hear this. To have a, a helpmate, to have somebody that cares so much about, and to be equally yoked because people don't understand when they say equally yoked, they think you're supposed to think just alike. No, you don't. Equally yoked means that God, your husband, is going to love you like Christ loved the church. That's mm-hmm. it. That he's going to respect you when you around and when you're not around. He's going to make sure that you covered. He's going to keep you covered. So now what we do, when we used to get upset, we, because we both tars. It's like, oh, I ain't trying to hear it. He called me pit bull in the skirt, and I'm calling him a lion, and we just going back and forth. But now it's like, let me go talk to God. I'm going to come back and talk to you. Cause right now we not on the same, and then right. he'll get quiet and he'll pray, and then he'll come and say, "No, I just pray for you." I'll be like, "Thank you, I pray for you too," because that's what it's about. So I'm just so grateful. It's unheard of. We get saved on the same day. We both musicians for the same church, and we just abundantly blessed. He comes home, and by the end of 2018, he blesses us through God. Well, God blessed him to be able to bless us to become God made millionaires. Wow. So to be African American young people, that's part owner of a, owners of seven emergency rooms. Wow. He's a day, a forex trader by day, gold versus the U.S. dollar. Wow. I've never had a job in my whole life. That's beautiful. And everything that he gives, he gives me ten percent to do what I do for other people. Wow. And the other day I sent him a picture of a purse. He sent it back. He said, <laughs> "You use your allowance on other people. You want me to buy you a purse? No, home girl, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm on a budget this month." So that's what that is. But I'm just saying I'm grateful for the fact that even when he don't want to go, sometimes he'll get up and he'll be like, I'll drive the prison trip for you today. You ain't got to go. You can stay asleep. I don't care if it's four hours. He'll go. And then we'll talk while he's going. He packed the cooler for the people. And he talked to the people while he's going. And he wait on them to come out. He take them out to eat. Every trip we do, we take everybody out to eat on the trip when we leave the prisons. Wow. Mm. That's so nice, man. Uh, you you totally blessed this show today. Well, thank you. Know, you know, like I said, man, we've had, a, we've had a lot of people on here, but I, I, I can't think of nobody that's blessed this platform the way you done blessed it today with your story. Well, I Meaning the way that this story came about, um, the fact that you've been through all that you've been through, and God still, you know, he's still, he's still there. He's he always there for us, man. No oh matter God. what, your dad and all that stuff that you went through, man, the, your mom, and I know it was tension there, but God knows everything. And, and people, people, this show right here is different than most because, I mean, if you watch it, if, you're, if your husband watch it like he say, he done seen some things on it. He him. have. Because we he talk about me. God, man. He told We me. talk about a lot of stuff, but God, it's three people, like I said, that sat in that seat uh, last year that they no longer with us. And every, all three of them, we got to talk about God. I'll say that every time because God has a way of stepping in the building. And everything happens for a I reason. I just said that I've on Sunday. I always said everything happens for a reason. And I meet, I, I meet so many people that um, lose lo- loved ones, whether they're a child or just anyone. And I always say, you know what? I always try to remember the good times because if you think about all the negativity, it's going to pull you down in a hole Either. and the devil is going to win. And if you don't want the devil to win, you have to cherish that person by the good because they gave you a lot of good memories. Yes. And sometimes I just a, go in my room and I have a music room in my house, like my little prayer room, and I got my daddy's 
Bible that he preached with in like a glass case with a picture of him with his obituary and it sits right there so when I'm playing my keyboard I can see it can so I, do I, I, play, I play his favorite songs what's so I'm his like, favorite song? Trouble in my way hey mm. I have to cry sometimes yeah so right. I can play it too boy I, I learned how to play gospel music playing the blues like I play it like the blues yeah. but I can play anything I hear yeah. Mm. So I used to get there and I get to play this song and I record and I post it on Facebook and my church member be like, oh, I wish you was back home so you could play. No, I'm not coming back there. Not going to happen. Yeah. I'm <laughs> following you today. I got to hear this. But you going to help, yeah. a, you help a lot of people who, because there's so many women out here who's lost their kids. Yes. And they won't listen to a person who have not lost theirs. Exactly. So because you've lost yours and overcame that, although it's a constant struggle, you're able to talk to them and touch them. And let me tell you what else. When I first got with my husband, this is what I'm telling you. Is I know this guy because when I first got with him, every time I started crying, he didn't know what, what to do to console me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would talk to his grandma, and that's who raised him, his dad's mom. And so now... He's learned me. So if I wake up depressed or if I, he come in that music room and I'm laying on the floor crying or he won't say nothing, the next morning he'll be like, oh, I got the cooler pack. You ready to go to Louisiana to the graveyard? Mm -hmm. my, son, know what? my son is buried next to my dad. Mm -hmm. So I get to go there to both of them to at both the same of them. time. And at what? one time I couldn't go, period. So now he just be like, okay, let's go. We're spending the day at the graveyard. And he'll just mm -hmm. let me sit there until yeah. I'm done. And he drive me back home. With wow. the business that you have, um, I can imagine how many people probably heard of it and want to contribute or want to help. No, it's, you're not going to believe this. A lot of people don't support that you would have thought would support. Right. And a lot of people that get the resources, they're not even putting in the work. Wow. So to me, you know, people say, oh, you, you definitely deserve a grant. I'm the only person in the United States that provide free luxury prison trips. You got people that do look prison trips. They're not luxury, but they may do them, but they charge you. I, I, get, I just got a call from a lady in California. I want to take my kids to see the daddy. Well, what do you want me to do? I mean, I didn't get my husband got me once I was in Beverly Hills, and I sent the lady some money in Washington, D.C., the Uber to the prison. He was, I said, I prayed about it first. He said, but you didn't talk to me about it first. <laughs> you know, I know if I talked to him, he's, he's, he's a... Atypical, mm. so he like, well, baby, daddy, mm. or well, her mama and cousin them met. You know, mm. sometimes he'll say that, but then he'll still eventually be like, go on, do it, teacher, because mm. I know you're gonna do it anyway. You know, right. you you want to help because you so, remember what it was like. Yeah, so it's so many people that don't support. On my two dollar Tuesday, I don't even get a hundred dollars. But you know what? I tell people, I just put it but out it's there. It's such a great cause. I always think that people be trying to. No, and God says to me, I say, God, you got a weird sense of humor. Right. I he love does. you, God, but you he got does. this sense of humor that's off the chain. Because if I'd have known to have a nonprofit, I had to ask people for money. I started without a 501c3 because I didn't know nothing about a nonprofit. I just started ring cards when I got out of prison from Enterprise mm -hmm. and taking people to the prisons. Mm. And so my husband was like, oh, you got to get legalized. You playing around. You have a wreck with these people in this car. So then I eventually legalized the business. But I say God knew if he knew I had to ask people for money, it would have never happened. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to be sitting there asking people and then they don't support. And it's like, you really don't want to support. But a lot of people don't because a lot of people don't know what they don't know. So if they never experienced it, oh, yeah, my cousin went to jail or whatever, it didn't affect my child or me or my spouse or whatever, then people don't really, they can't feel it. Mm -hmm. And people don't really support what they don't That's know. True. That's so true. So I don't even, now, I, I say, God says, listen, you have to give people an opportunity to get blessed. Mm -hmm. Because if some people wouldn't have never met you, they would never give to nothing. Mm -hmm. So you put it out there. If they do it, they get the blessings. And if they don't, they miss the blessings. That's so that's what I do. I put it out there for people to do it. I'm not, bar I'm not begging. I'm not falling out, crying, none of that. Because God says, well, I give a vision, I'll make the provision. Some businesses don't last eight months. Here mm -hmm. I am, eight years. Mm -hmm. Never a government nothing. Wow. But a God everything. You hear mm -hmm. me? So I'm good. I'm Me and God Gucci like that. Man, hey. I just want to say, man, um, Keep doing your thing. And if there's anything I can do, make sure you let me know. I appreciate uh, it. You can always come back, and if you want to announce something or get something out there. This, this well, we have an eight-year anniversary on May the 27th. And okay. so we're um, we're having Luther Barnes come. Okay. Um, and it's going to be at Calvary, Calvary Philadelphia Church in Oak Cliff on Sunnyvale. I think it's 4703 Sunnyvale, and it's a Saturday. So it's May the 27th at 3 o'clock. I have my goddad, who's the bishop, 
that visited me the whole time I was in mm. prison. Wow. Um, he doesn't know I'm going to honor him now because wow. he was there for me when nobody else was. Mm. Like, I was such a crybaby. I would, his sister was the sheriff. So I just start crying. Be like, can you call Reverend Gordon and tell him to come up here? He be running to the jail every day. One day he said, listen, Chucky, now this pity party got to stop because yeah. you did this to yourself. Yeah. I can't run up here every day, but to this day, that man has been in my life, and I'm grateful for him. So yeah, he's, he's, He lives he lives in Shreveport, in Shreveport but yeah. he can sing. He going to be there. He going to sing? He got some YouTube. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Man. So he's going to be there. Man, so thank I'm you so much, man. Hey, man, listen, man. Uh, make sure you got to like and subscribe to the channel, man. Uh, Letitia just come through. Letitia done came through and blessed our platform, man. Uh, yeah. Um, did you want to ask her about how did she get um, connected with Judge Joe Brown? Or that's, that's for yeah, another. That's fine. Let's talk about it. We get, we okay. can. Uh, it's fine. So listen, I, my my one of my friends, she's a, a doctor, a, a minister in Louisiana, and she went to the Grammys. So she meets this lady from Florida, and they started talking. And this lady is a PR person. Well, going into the new year, I just fired, like I just let go of my team because it just got the guy just says you got to do some new energy. Like this is not working. So anyway, long story short, they called me on the phone. She put me on a three way with her. And she just instantly falls in love with me over the phone. So she's the PR person for Judge Joe Brown. Wow. So she gets on the phone with me and we started talking. And instantly, she just started doing all this stuff for me. I ain't given her a penny. And then the next that week, the next week, she was like, you want to get on the show with Judge Joe Brown? And I was like, you serious? Because I, I like him and Judge Mathis. Mm-hmm. So she was like, yeah. So we talked about violence and the youth of the day and how we, you know, I had recently did a radio interview with some people from, I forgot the name of the radio station. But anyway, it was a Republican radio station. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to talk about building more. What were my thoughts on building more prisons for youth? I don't have thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. I have the fact that if you want to build 200 prisons for youth, mm-hmm. you need to build 200 rehabilitation centers, mm-hmm. 200 foster homes, I mean, mm-hmm. houses for people. No, I mean, they need counseling. They need mental. Outposts. People need to get them some godly game. Right. Because, see, that's what my mentorship is about. We didn't really talk about that, but Boys in Blue and Girls, too, where I took my allowance and started 13 businesses for 13 people, age 5 mm-hmm. through 28. Age 5? Through 28. As young as 5, wow. Yes, they were. they 7 and 8 now, right. but this was two years ago. But right. everybody in my family, I make sure we good. Every them, And half of them people ain't in my family. They just people that I met on this journey, and I want to see your life change. So we Googled, I Googled the other day how many prisons are in um, Texas compared to anywhere else, and Texas has the most. Exactly. They got three on the same street. That's crazy. Yes. So and they got them four is nine hours away, all the way to the border. So they have a lot of prisons. But we started that program just to help children mm. and to show people. And that's what the judge was talking about. How they have he met with he's with this lady that has this aviation program where they get these kids housing and funding to learn how to fly airplanes. Wow. So I was able to get on that show, and then the very next day they called me and gave me my own show. So now That's I have a radio amazing. show with Tisha Talks. So hey. I'm grateful. Yes, I'm grateful. Man, thank you so much, man. Hey, man, listen. Listen, man. It's been another great segment. Of course. Thank song. you. First of all, we love you. Bless you. I love you all, too. Thank you all for having it's me. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And all we right. out.